right, everybody. <laughs> what a beautiful time of worship that was. Oh my goodness, what a joy, what a grace to come into the presence of God. There's something that happens when we worship the Lord together. Things move, things change, demons flee, angels come, <laughs> angels are released. And the Lord brought to my mind this passage that you, many of you know, in 2 Chronicles 20, when Israel is about to be invaded by three enemy nations all at once. They're outnumbered, they're terrified, and they all gather together and worship. And this part I never really noticed before. As they're there in the midst of the assembly, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, and he began to prophesy. Worship releases prophecy. Worship releases the spirit of prophecy upon God's people. And, and here's this guy who, you know, he'd never appeared before in the Bible. I don't think he comes up uh, again after this. But the spirit of the Lord came upon him as they were worshiping. And the Lord spoke through him strategy for the battle. And he said... Listen, all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord to you, fear not and be not dismayed at this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley east of the wilderness of Jeruel. So he tells them exactly where the enemy is going to show up. He tells them where and when they need to move in the battle. And then, in response to that prophetic word, which they recognize as a word from the Lord, King Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. <laughs> That's what we've been doing tonight, amen? <laughs> on your face before the Lord in worship, battle position. That's how the battle is won. When we're outnumbered by the enemy, which in many ways we are today, we are to be together before the Lord in worship and he will release his spirit of prophecy. And, and I believe the Lord has been releasing the spirit of prophecy on us tonight, including those who are online. And the Lord has been speaking to people's hearts about the strategy for the battle, about where and when and how he's calling you to fight the battle. But more importantly, fear not, because the battle belongs to the Lord. <laughs> when we come into his presence, we get that. I mean, at other times we say that, right? We always say that. The battle belongs to the Lord. You know, we sing it. There's a song called that. Sorry, my map's falling out. <laughs> um, but when we worship the Lord together, we get it. And that changes the whole way we respond to the situations that we're faced with. That's actually not my topic for tonight, though. <laughs> Let me get into my topic for tonight. Um, what was Jesus speaking about in the 40 days between his ascension, between his resurrection and his ascension into heaven? Those 40 mysterious days when the apostles were with the risen Lord and he was giving them his final teachings, his final instruction. What was he talking about? Luke actually tells us. Anybody know? What was he talking about? No? He was talking about the kingdom of God. It's right there at the beginning of Acts of the Apostles. He spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Fast forward all the way to the end of the Acts of the Apostles. Paul, the great missionary, is under house arrest and not stopped even with that. He is continuing to teach and preach all day long to the people who come to him. And guess what he's talking about? You got it. The kingdom of God. Guess what I'm going to talk about tonight? <laughs> How'd you know? <laughs> the, kingdom 
the kingdom of God. When Jesus began his public ministry, when he began to teach right after his baptism, what was his message? The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's the preaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's only one sentence. That's how the gospels sum up, at least at the, at the beginning, that's how they sum up his whole message. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. He's saying something totally new has happened. God has broken into history. Everything has changed. The kingdom is here because the king is here. Now, to fully get that message, you have to know the backstory. We we know the backstory. It really began in the garden. When God created our first parents and he put them in this place of incredible beauty and delight and life. And they walked with God in the cool of the day. Intimacy with God. But then the snake came into the garden and he seduced them with the lie. That they couldn't trust God. That God didn't want them to be fulfilled, to be happy, to have what they needed for life. And they bought the lie. And from that moment on, the evil one had his foothold in the world. And from that moment on, in human history, this shadow of darkness has, has spread over humanity and even over the world. And it, it makes me think of the, um, the Lord of the Rings and how the, the shadow of Mordor, the place of evil, it, it had held regions of Middle Earth in its grip. They were under the shadow. And there was a darkness and there was oppression and there was a lack of freedom and there was continuous fear and there was control and there was a lack of, of, of the joy and the fulfillment that they desired. That's what the world has been ever since the, the fall. And Jesus called Satan the ruler of this world, the deceiver of this whole world. And the first letter of John says, the whole world is in the power of the evil one. Anybody ever seen anything that might kind of suggest that, like when reading in the headlines? <laughs> when looking at the news, when even looking out on the street, what, what's happening, maybe even looking sometimes in our own families, we, the entire human race, have been under that shadow so much, we are like children who've grown up in a war zone, and we don't even know what normal is. I remember one time reading about the children who lived in, in Bosnia and Her Herzegovina during the Balkans War in the 90s, and some of the children developed gray hair. That phenomenon can happen sometimes when they, they've lived in a constant state of terror. Constantly bombs falling and the, and the sirens blaring and they don't know what normal is. How many people today are living that way under that shadow? Or maybe it's, it's also like children who have grown up in a dysfunctional family. A family where we're where cursing and anger and, and throwing things around or, or abuse are normal. And they don't know what normal is. That's all they know. That's what the human, life, the human race has been since the fall. We don't even know what normal is. It's also like what's described in the book of Judges. The book of Judges is a time in Israel's history when there was, there was instability and there was a constant attack from one side or another, their enemies, and Israel had no king. They were just a loose federation of tribes, and sometimes they were united, and sometimes they were disunited. But the refrain that is, that is repeated again and again is, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Everyone did what he felt like doing. 
Does that sound like anything we may sometimes see in our culture? Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Everyone says, I'll do what I want. No, God's going to tell me what to do. Isn't that what our culture is saying loud and clear? We'll do what's right in our own eyes. Well, under that gloom of darkness, God sent prophets to encourage his people, to give them hope. And one of the passages in Isaiah says, there will be no gloom for her that was in anguish. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. In that same passage, he talks about Galilee of the Gentiles. Jesus gets baptized centuries after that, and he comes into Galilee, and he says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Father Michael Scanlon, who was the president of Franciscan University of Steubenville, and he wrote a beautiful book on deliverance. He said this about Jesus' announcement of the kingdom. He said, the proclamation of the arrival of the kingdom was a shattering event in history. A shattering event in history. He said, Jesus was not just another wise teacher who made his appearance and left his sayings as a source of inspiration for future disciples. The kingdom he proclaimed is not merely another alternative lifestyle that you can accept or reject on the basis of personal preference, <coughs> sorry, personality, convenience, or cultural heritage. The central message of the kingdom cuts through such, such superficialities and speaks to man about his very life. It's a shattering event in history because it's the turning point. It is the, the center of the entirety of history from the beginning of time to the end of time is the coming of Jesus. And when he announced the kingdom, it immediately faced everyone and still faces everyone with a decision. The kingdom is here because the king is here. That means it's the downfall of the kingdom of Satan, the shadow that has been reigning over the earth, holding it in its grip. And yet that kingdom of Satan is still Continuing for now, and these two kingdoms, therefore, are now coexisting side by side. Jesus talks about that in the parable of the wheat and the weeds, right? The, the weeds are growing up along with the wheat at the same time. So they're both existing on the earth right now, locked in battle. So there's this clash of kingdoms. Are you going to enter into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus. That's the decision. There's one kingdom and then there's the other. There's no kingdom of the in-between. There's no kingdom of the gray. Jesus' decision, uh, Jesus' announcement is a call to a decision to enter the kingdom that he is proclaiming. And the response that he specifically calls for is repent and believe the gospel. Repent. We think of, you know, the sacrament of reconciliation, and that's very important to repent, but, but really the word repent means more than that. Metanoio is the verb. Metanoia is repentance. And it means not just change your behavior. It, it, it doesn't mean shape up. Jesus is not saying the kingdom is here, shape up. He's not saying get, the kingdom is here, get your act together. <laughs> no, metanoeo means go beyond your thinking. Have a radical change in mentality. And actually, my favorite definition of, of that verb repent is from Jeff Cavins. It simply means radically reorient your life. 
reorient your entire life because everything has changed because the king is here. Repent and believe in the gospel. Believe. That doesn't just mean, obviously, you know, I accept the truth that the kingdom is here. To believe means you stake your whole life on it. It means nothing can compare in value to that kingdom. It means you are that, that man who found the pearl of great price and said, there is no treasure in the world that compares with it. I'm selling everything to buy that pearl. Nothing can, can weigh on the scales in comparison with that, that pearl of great price. I'm giving everything. I'm staking everything on the reality of the kingdom that's here. Jesus proclaimed it, and then he began to demonstrate it. Immediately on proclaiming the kingdom, he began to heal the sick and cast out demons. Those two things are not unconnected. In, in, in fact, they, they absolutely cannot be separated. Healing and deliverance <clears throat> are the signs that the kingdom is here. They are the demonstration that what Jesus is saying is really true. The reign of the enemy is over. The shadow is leaving. The, the sun is breaking through the cloud. The oppression is dissipating. Yeah. It's leaving. It's defeated. And the, the healings and the deliverance are signs of that. That's why so much of his ministry was healing and deliverance. He says, if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus ties them together like that. If it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, the kingdom of God has come upon you. It has come. Now how about healing? When John the Baptist was in prison, he started to get unsure about whether Jesus really was the king, the one who was to come, the promised Messiah, the anointed one. And so he sent his messengers to ask Jesus, are you the one? Because you're not doing what we thought you would do. You haven't overthrown the Romans. Are, are you the one or are we supposed to look for another? The messengers came to Jesus. And they asked him that question. He didn't say anything. Maybe, maybe just with his look, he said, watch. It says, in that hour, he cured many of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many that were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, go tell John what you have seen and heard. I just picture these guys, they're, they're standing there watching. And they, they see the blind receive sight. They see deaf ears open. They see lame people get up and start to leap around. And they didn't need Jesus to tell them in words. They saw it with their own eyes. The kingdom is here because the king is here. And they went back and told John just that. So when Jesus is asked, you know, how do we know you're the Messiah? What are your credentials as the one who is to come? What's your ID card? Healings, <laughs> deliverances, that is the absolutely unmistakable sign that he is the one God promised. Because part of that shadow that was unleashed upon the world by the fall is brokenness in the body, brokenness in the human heart, brokenness in relationships, every kind of disorder, every kind of ugliness and darkness and Jesus' healings demonstrate all of that is coming to an end because the kingdom is here. So I want to, I want to talk about one healing, maybe two if there's time. I want to talk about one I've 
never, never really talked about before. And it's in Luke 13. It says this. He was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity, had had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called to her and said, Woman, you are freed from your infirmity. Okay, now, first of all, it says she had a spirit of infirmity. So that is clearly telling us her condition, and therefore some conditions, had a demonic cause. It was not a purely medical condition. There was a spirit of infirmity at work in this case. She was bent over. She couldn't fully straighten herself. Today, scholars uh, would uh, sp speculate that this is probably a form of arthritis. I think it's called spondylitis, where um, gradually the spine becomes distorted and a, a person gets hunched over and they're no longer able to straighten up. So this is an image of the human race under the shadow. This is an image of the dominion of darkness. We're bent over. This woman could not lift up her head. She probably didn't even know Jesus was there. She could only see one thing. What could she see? The ground for 18 years. What an image of oppression. What an image of, of, of dignity, degraded, pressed down, weighed down, incapable of standing up straight, unable to, to even be aware of, of her human dignity, and probably other people just seeing her in that condition also were not fully recognizing her human dignity. She doesn't see Jesus, but he saw her. She didn't cry out in this case. She didn't beg for healing. He saw her. It doesn't even say she had faith. She, she just was there, just trying to cope with her oppression. He saw her, and he had compassion. And he simply made a declaration. He didn't say, woman, be free. He didn't say, come here, I'm, I want to free you. He just said, woman, you are freed from your infirmity. He declared it. Now, Jesus did that, but surely his followers can't do that, can they? <laughs> How about Peter in the Acts of the Apostles when he sees this guy, Aeneas, who's been bedridden, paralyzed for years? Aeneas! Jesus Christ heals you. Boom. Rise and make your bed. And he's up. Jesus declares the reality of the kingdom and the reality of the kingdom comes to be in her life, in her body. Brothers and sisters, Jesus has given us a share in his authority to declare the reality of the kingdom, the presence of the kingdom. He wants to increase our faith so that we hear his voice and know when and in what ways to declare the reality, the victory of the kingdom in specific instances over specific infirmities. And then it says, he, lays, he laid his hands on her. So he declared it, but he also laid his hands on her. And it's interesting that in that culture, men would not even talk to, much less, much less touch, women they did not know, or women who were not their wives or close relatives. But in almost all Jesus' healings of women, he touches them. He touches them. He, he took the hand of Peter's, Peter's mother-in-law. He took the hand of Jairus' daughter, and he laid hands on this woman. He doesn't care about social barriers. He wants her to know his touch. 
and she was made straight. Immediately. It happened immediately. She was made straight. Isaiah prophesied the crooked ways will be made straight. <laughs> crooked backs will be made straight. Later on, Jesus is going to say, when, when you see the signs of the end drawing near, stand up straight and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. This lady stood up and raised up her head because her redemption had come. And then it says she praised God. So that's, that's her response. It's the right response. She praised God. Can you imagine 18 years like this, N unable to stand? Can you imagine how painful that must be? How difficult it must make daily tasks. And all of a sudden, after 18 years, she's able to stand up straight. Do you think she said, oh, praise God? <laughs> Sometimes the gospels kind of, you know, you know they're, they're, um, they, they downplay a little bit. <laughs> what's really going on uh, they're low key I think this lady probably jumped for joy she shouted praises of God she glorified God she couldn't stop praising and thanking God and the entire crowd sees that and they're overwhelmed and they start praising God too the kingdom liberates those who were under the dominion of darkness. The kingdom is a kingdom of freedom. The kingdom is a kingdom of healing. Now it goes on there, it says, the ruler of the synagogue was indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. You think maybe they're missing something here? <laughs> and Jesus, Jesus says, you hypocrites, don't you each on the Sabbath untie your ox or your donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it. Should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? In other words, he's saying the Sabbath is the right time to set people free. In the book of Deuteronomy, God tells the people to celebrate the Sabbath every seven days because you were in bondage. You were bound in slavery in Egypt, and God set you free. The very meaning of the Sabbath is release from bondage, setting free. And Jesus is fulfilling the Sabbath. So it, sh it should be done on the Sabbath. That's why all the healings he initiates are on the Sabbath. He's fulfilling the, 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 the prefigurement, the, the type of the freedom that Israel gained in the Exodus. And everyone who saw it rejoiced. And again, I, I think they were not just like, oh, wow, that's cool. <laughs> you know, I think they had seen this lady for 18 years. I think they were in awe as they saw with, with this sign before their eyes, the kingdom is here. Another one, now I'll just do this other healing quickly because I um, won't have time to let, the, let Jesus act right here and now. It's when Jesus was again in the synagogue. This is in Luke 6, verse 6. And there was a man there whose right hand was withered. His right hand is withered, paralyzed, dried up. It means he, he can't work with it, which in that culture is devastating socially and financially. He can't do manual labor, which is the way most people survived back then. But there's more to a withered right hand in Psalm 138, or sorry, 137, the Israelites are in Babylon. The, the Jews are in Babylon in exile, and, and they're longing to be back in Jerusalem in the temple. And it says, by the waters of Babylon, we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. So this man's withered hand is a sign of the whole people dried up. Why, are, why were they in exile in Babylon at that time? Because they forgot God. 
They forgot the temple. They committed idolatry. They wandered away from the Lord. And so having, having the right hand withered is, is a symbol of Israel under that shadow of darkness because they had forgotten God. And Jesus restoring this man is restoring Israel. So the scribes and Pharisees are watching him to see if he's going to heal on the Sabbath. Again, they're not quite tracking with what's going on. And Jesus told the man to come up in front of everyone. I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or destroy it? And the answer is obvious. And looking around at them, he's grieved at their hardness of heart. He said to the man, stretch out your hand. What's the one thing that guy couldn't do? Stretch out his hand. So Jesus called this guy to make an act of faith. I mean, the guy could have said, can't you see? I can't. But this guy, in response to the command of Jesus, tried to do the impossible. And in doing the impossible, it became possible by the word of the Lord. And his hand was totally restored. It's a sign of the restoration of the whole people. It's also a fulfillment of another passage in Isaiah. Isaiah 35, verse 3. Strengthen the hands that are feeble. Make firm the knees that are weak. Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong. Fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will save you. Does anybody here have feeble hands or weak knees, even literally, or a crooked back? Raise your hand. Okay, a few of you. All right, we're going to pray for that specifically tonight. A couple of weeks ago, I was giving a parish mission in um, Lansing at St. Mary's. You were there. <laughs> and... Um, I uh, gave some word of knowledge, words of knowledge, and one of the words of knowledge was, I think the Lord wants to inflate lungs tonight. And then we were praying for people, and people were coming up to testify, and, and then I, I looked down the aisle, and I, I, I see this woman getting out of her wheelchair. She had just disconnected her ventilator <laughs> that is what allowed her to breathe through the trachea, she you know, normally was not able to be off the ventilator for more than a few seconds. She disconnected it of her own accord. And then she stood up and she found that she was okay. And then she started walking down the aisle. <laughs> and she'd been in the wheelchair for 13 years. <laughs> and she, she comes to the front and she's, she's kind of speechless. She, she had to talk through the trach anyway, but um, her husband <laughs> explained her, her condition and that, you know, she couldn't do this. And it was, it was just amazing. Everybody there saw the kingdom is here. <laughs> the kingdom is here because the king is here. <laughs> and she had made that act of faith, just like the man with the withered hand. She had, she had made it. Uh, she had stepped out. She had taken a risk in faith. And the Lord came through for her. So, when Jesus told his followers to continue his mission, so that they would be able to, for the end of time, extend the presence of his kingdom throughout the whole earth, what message did he tell them to preach? He said, go, preach, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. <laughs> it's the same thing as the kingdom of God. Go wherever you, um, he, he said, preach as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. Kingdom and healing, you see how closely united they are. Preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse lepers. Cast out demons. 
And then in uh, Luke, Jesus sends out the 70 other disciples. Guess what he tells them to preach? Hopefully you're seeing a pattern here. <laughs> he says, heal the sick. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of, heaven, of God has come near to you. Do you get an idea that this is at the very core of the gospel? This is the very core of the message Jesus is calling us to preach, to proclaim to the whole world. And that we're to preach it not only in words, but in healings and deliverances that demonstrate, that embody the words. And they came back and they gave Jesus their mission reports, the 70. Lord, even the demons are subject to us. In your name, they're so excited that we're seeing the kingdom. We're seeing people who were under demonic bondage, under deep oppression, people who were harassed, maybe people who were addicted, people who were enslaved in sin get set free. We're seeing the, the kingdom that, that so many longed for right here in our midst before our eyes. And Jesus said to them, he said, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you, many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not, and to hear what you hear and did not. How many long for the kingdom. How privileged you are. How incredibly blessed you are to actually see it before your eyes. Now, it's in the very next chapter, Luke 11, when the disciples ask Jesus, teach us how to pray. And so he tells them, say this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. <laughs> Thy kingdom come. And then Jesus explains, what, what does it mean for the kingdom to come? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what the kingdom is. It's his will being done. And what is his will? As Paul says, it's, it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. What is his will? Freedom. Freedom. Freedom! <laughs> what is his will? Healing. Wholeness. Forgiveness. Release. Thanksgiving, joy, all of those things are where are present where the Lord is, where his will is being done. Now, Jesus also said something that is, is sometimes perplexing to people in the Gospels. He said, amen, I, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see that the kingdom of God has come in power. Many people, scholars, uh, read that and say, obviously Jesus was mistaken because he evidently thought that his second coming would be within the lifetime of his contemporaries, and obviously that didn't happen. But he doesn't say that people will see my second coming. He says there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see that the kingdom of God has come in power. So what is he talking about? Well, come back to the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles. He's about to ascend into heaven. And for those 40 days, he's talking about the kingdom of God. He ascends into heaven. And what happens next? Nine days later, Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit is poured out. And the 120 disciples stream forth from the upper room proclaiming the kingdom with signs and wonders and people are coming into the kingdom and people are getting free from idolatry, from paganism, from the worship of false gods and all of the darkness that comes with that. And they're coming to the knowledge of God, to intimacy with God, forgiveness of their sins. They're becoming sons and daughters of God. That's what he means by the coming of the kingdom in power. In fact, again, right before he ascended into heaven, when it says he was talking about the kingdom, the, the apostle said, 
So, Lord, um, will the kingdom be restored to, to Israel now? So they didn't fully get it yet, right? He doesn't answer on their level. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. You want to see the kingdom? You want the kingdom to come to Israel? You want, you want the kingdom to be manifest? The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And you will witness to me. That's how the kingdom will come. And that's exactly what they do from the day of Pentecost onward. And it, it, it talks about Philip, for example. He went to Samaria. He preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And the multitudes with one accord gave heed to what he said when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits came out of many who were possessed, crying with a loud voice, and many who were lame or paralyzed were healed. He proclaimed the kingdom with words. He demonstrated the kingdom with supernatural signs. Brothers and sisters, that's what we're called to. We are the ambassadors of the kingdom. In the ancient world, if the king was making a state visit to a, a, another province or an important city, a herald would precede him, announcing, the king is at hand. The king is coming. We are the heralds of the king. We are to be just like the 70 that Jesus sent out in the gospel going wherever the Lord leads us to go and declaring to people, I have something to tell you. The darkness is at an end. The kingdom has come because the king has come. <laughs> and we are to tell people that not only with words which can be consoling and can be meaningful and can be helpful and important to people but they can also say yeah whatever that's nice for you we're to tell them that message in signs i'm so excited about the um the conference coming up about a healing lifestyle because that's essentially what it is it's living the lifestyle of the ambassadors of the king who go around making that declaration and demonstrating that that declaration is true. As St. Paul said, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. It's not a matter of talk, but of power. We are the secret agents of the kingdom. <laughs> we are infiltrating this world, still very much under the dominion of darkness in many ways, but we are putting the dominion of darkness on notice <laughs> that his time is over. Wow, what a, what a beautiful bunch of secret agents you are. <laughs> I mean, you know, if the, if the Lord, you know, if, if we had... Um, decided who should be appointed to be the secret agents announcing and bringing the presence of the kingdom in this world, we might not have chosen ourselves. <laughs> like, we're probably not the most, you know, talented, prepared, smart, uh, qualified group of people you could find on earth to do this. And Jesus says, you are exactly the right ones. You are exactly the ones I want and that I've chosen. And I've given you everything you need to be my, my secret agents and my ambassadors. So I want to do a little activation now. Are you ready for a little activation? And then we're going to do ministry. So let's, let's come into the presence of the Lord. Maybe if the music ministry is around, you can. All right. Um, I want to first ask the Lord to show us any ways that he is not yet fully the king 
in our lives. I feel like he wants to bring areas of our lives more fully under his kingship tonight. And some specific things that he might speak to each of us individually about. I think one is fear. Fear is simply worshiping another god. It's, it's actually honoring another god and holding that that god is more powerful than our god. It's one thing to feel fear. That's, that's a natural human emotion. But to live under fear is not living under the kingship of Jesus. He wants to be, us to be free of that. Child of God doesn't live under fear. Another area is self-condemnation, self-doubt. Any comparing of ourselves, like if we, if we notice that we're, we, there's a pattern of comparing ourselves to others and maybe putting ourselves down, or maybe sometimes trying to put ourselves over others, it's really just another form of the same thing, is putting self on the throne. And then there's self-striving. Self-striving belongs to the old life, the old dominion, the old dispensation, living under the law. The children of the kingdom don't live under the law. It doesn't mean we sin. It doesn't mean we disobey the law. It means we live in a freedom higher than the law. It means the king is at work in us, empowering us. So I think he wants to free some people from kind of self-striving where you're, you're constantly trying to um, achieve holiness as a human work. And the Lord says, I want you to be released from that. I want you to let go of that. I want you to walk in the freedom of the children of God. Let's also ask the Lord. Lord, are you fully the king of my marriage? Has my marriage been brought fully under your kingship? Maybe a relationship with children. Is that under the kingship of Jesus? Are my finances under the kingship of Jesus? Are my eating habits under the kingship of Jesus? Is my daily schedule under the kingship of Jesus? Are my thoughts under the kingship of Jesus? If I have thoughts of discouragement, if I have thoughts of complaining, of griping in certain situations, then that's an area that's not under the kingship of Jesus yet. He wants to reign as king in every one of those areas. He wants to reign on the throne of our hearts in such a radical way. And it can be hard to let go, to surrender our self-will, but it's such freedom to do that. So wherever you you see in any of the things that I mentioned that Jesus has not been fully king or that you've been trying to share the throne with him? It's very simple. Repent and believe. 
Just repent and believe. Invite Jesus to be the king over that area and name whatever specific areas come to your mind that you, you recognize you've been trying to share control with him. Invite him to be fully the king. And also, um, any ways that we have resisted our call to be ambassadors of the King. Any ways that we have been motivated by fear of man or indifference. Or self-centeredness worldliness forgive us Lord for not carrying out our mandate to announce the kingdom We're just so grateful for the privilege that what a what a small percentage of the human beings who've ever lived have known your kingdom the way we do and have seen it manifested the way we do how blessed we are Lord let us not keep to ourselves that gift Oh, Lord, let our tongues not be silent. Oh, Lord, let our feet not hesitate to go wherever you send us. Lord, let our hands not be drooping. Let our knees not be weak. And let our hearts not be discouraged. Oh, Lord God, your kingdom is hidden. It's buried in a field. It's secret. And yet it has such explosive power. Lord, let that power explode in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, let each of us be a, a walking kingdom, a walking kingdom of God, an outpost of the kingdom, a place of light in the midst of the land of shadow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, what a joy to be in your kingdom. Lord, let us never cease to praise you and thank you for that joy. Thank you, Lord. Could we all stand up for a moment? Let's declare the kingdom also in any areas of sickness or debility that are present here. I asked earlier if anybody has drooping hands. That includes arthritic hands, hands in pain, weak hands, paralyzed hands, or, um, or weak knees. That includes arthritic knees. That includes injured knees or um, crooked backs. That includes backs in pain. Backs with scoliosis, backs with arthritis, anything else. Um, so one more time, raise your hand if you have any of those things. Okay, it's more of you this time. Oh my gosh, you've gotten sicker. 
<laughs> Since a half hour ago. <laughs> All right. Raise your hand one more time and everybody look around. Just lay your hand on somebody near you who has their hand raised. And let's declare. Let's just declare in the name of Jesus. The kingdom is here. Backs, acknowledge the kingdom. Be straightened in the name of Jesus. Hands be strengthened. Knees be strengthened. Be lifted up in the name of Jesus. Pain depart in the name of Jesus. Bodies be healed because the kingdom is here. Amen. All right, check yourselves out. You all know how to do that. Try to move what you couldn't move. Bend, do cartwheels, do flips, backflips. All right, if, you, if you've experienced a healing just now, keep checking. If you haven't experienced a healing yet, just keep checking it out until you do. <laughs> if you have experienced a healing, wave your hands over your head. Wave them. Praise God. Glory to God. And if you're on the, on the Zoom, are they able to use the chat? No? Okay, we don't have a chat. Well, oh, they are able to. Okay, let us know if you're online, if you experienced a healing. Let's do that one more time. I, I feel like the Lord, um, he wants to heal somebody with a pain in their tooth and their jaw on the right side. Anybody here have that? All right, let's pray for that too. A lot of people over there. Okay. <laughs> Everybody over there has jaw pain on the right side. <laughs> All right. Let, let's pray for that too. And let's, let's pray again for anybody else who raised their hand a minute ago. In the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus I, declare I declare that the kingdom of God is here. The of God is here. Because the king is here. Teeth be healed. Jaws be healed. In the name of Jesus. Pain leave. Leave all bodies. All hands. All knees. All weakness depart. In the name of Jesus. All oppression. We break your power. In the, In the name of Jesus, we declare his victory, declare his victory. Over, the over the dominion of darkness and every spirit of infirmity. Yes, spirit of we, command you to flee. we command you to flee. In the name of Jesus, name of Jesus. Amen. amen. Okay, check yourselves out again. Okay, and again, anybody who's experienced a healing, wave your hands over your head. <laughs> wave your hands one more time because it's hard for me to see up here. Wave both hands over your head. <laughs> Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.